last video we talked about the goal of the nanograph project which is to detect gravitational waves and what we want to do in this video is look a little bit more into just what are these gravitational waves that we're trying to find now to understand gravitational waves we first have to look at Einstein's description of gravity general relativity Now, most of us are used to thinking of gravity as being a pulling force that holds us to the Earth. But Einstein thought of gravity very differently. Rather than thinking of gravity as a pulling force, Einstein said that gravity is the result of the curvature of space-time. And massive objects can actually bend the space-time near them, actually changing how we measure space and time near massive objects. And this curvature of space-time will actually affect the motion of particles that move by. Now, this is a lot to kind of take in in one shot, but a good analogy to help describe this picture is the rubber sheet analogy. So let's imagine this big rubber sheet as representing all of space. Now, if I were to put a heavy object, a heavy bowling ball or something like that, on this rubber sheet, then the mass of that object is going to curve the sheet nearby. Farther out, it's not going to really affect much, but close in, it really is going to curve that sheet. Now, if I were to roll a marble past this object, the marble isn't going to follow the straight trajectory that it would have if this bowling ball weren't there. Rather, the motion of the marble is going to curve along with the curvature of the rubber sheet. And this kind of gives you an idea how massive objects will actually curve space around them and that curvature of space will affect the trajectory of particles. And this is what we actually perceive as gravity. Now, this isn't a perfect analogy. We're not living on some two-dimensional rubber sheet, but inside a four-dimensional space-time. But it kind of gives you the idea of how Einstein viewed gravity. Now, it turns out that this is not the only way that massive objects can curve space. General relativity predicts that certain systems or certain configurations of massives can actually produce ripples in space-time. And these ripples will move away from their source, much like the ripples in a pond. Systems like binary stars, so stars that are in orbit around each other, or even binary black holes, pairs of black holes that are orbiting each other, are expected to produce very strong gravitational waves. Also, neutron stars. Uh, if I have two neutron stars that are colliding with each other, we expect to see a very large burst of gravitational waves. Or if I have an individual neutron star that's slightly bumpy and spinning, it will produce these, these waves. Uh, we expect that most supernova, uh, most supernova will actually uh, produce gravitational waves. Even in the very early universe, we expect there were systems that strongly produced gravitational waves. So we have all of these different sources of gravitational waves, and it turns out that the exact characteristics of the gravitational waves produced depend on what kind of system produced them. So in the same way that if I have some source of light, so let's say a, a light bulb or something like that, if I have some source of light, this gives off electromagnetic waves. And these electromagnetic waves have an amplitude, they have a wavelength, they have a frequency, they have a polarization, they have all of this different, uh, the different properties of this electromagnetic wave. In the same way, gravitational waves also have an amplitude, a wavelength, a frequency, and a polarization. So if we can measure these gravitational waves that are emitted by various sources, in the same way that light contains information about the source that emitted it, these gravitational waves also contain information about the different systems that produced them. So let's look at a specific system where gravitational waves are produced. So this is a video of a NASA simulation of the merger of two black holes. We have a black hole here and here. And these colored lines represent the curvature of space-time around these black holes. So as I start the video, these black holes are in orbit around each other, and they're curving space around them. And as these black holes orbit each other, they produce gravitational waves. As we zoom out, we can see these uh, large red wispy lines that actually represent the gravitational waves that are being produced. 
And as these uh, black holes spin faster and faster, the frequency and amplitude of the gravitational waves increase until the final merger where we're left with one black hole at the end. So let's go back uh, in this video a little bit. We notice that as these gravitational waves are produced, they will actually move away from this source at the speed of light. And the idea is that these gravitational waves actually contain information about how these black holes merged. So if we can detect these gravitational waves, we can actually learn about this system that produced them. So there's the end of the video again. So the next question we might ask is, what do these gravitational waves actually do as they move through space? Well, as I mentioned, these waves are actually perturbations or small oscillations or changes in the curvature of space-time. So as these waves pass by, they will actually change and distort space-time, stretching it in one direction while compressing it in another. And I have a nice video to, uh, to describe this. So let's say out in the middle of nowhere in empty space, I have a ring of evenly spaced particles. And let's say a gravitational wave hit this face on. So the gravitational wave is going either straight into or straight out of the computer screen. Well, as the gravitational wave hits this object, it's actually going to distort the amount of space that this object takes up. It'll stretch it in one direction and compress it in another. And, and it will repeatedly do this as, uh, as the gravitational wave passes by. Now, the motion illustrated here would require a gravitational wave far, far more powerful than anything we expect to see. And it's actually, uh, it's actually kind of a good thing that we don't see this kind of motion, this kind of extreme stretching of objects, because if that happened, it would happen to us as well and would probably be a very unpleasant thing to experience. So how powerful do we actually expect some of these gravitational waves to be? Well, a common measure for the strength of a gravitational wave that we like to use is referred to as the strain. And the strain is basically a comparison between the original length of, of your object, so say the radius of this uh, circle of particles, compared to how much that length changed when the gravitational wave hit it. So if this is our original, the original length that we were measuring, this is how much it changed by. So the strain is just this delta L over L. Now, for this particular picture, we see that this delta L is about half as much uh, as the original length it was. So this strain uh, corresponding to these pictures is about 0.5. Now, for actual gravitational waves that we expect to see, the maximum strains we expect are only going to be 10 to the minus 15. So length changes should only be about one part in a million billion. So kind of uh, for something to compare that to, this is like the distance from the Earth to the moon changing by a hundredth the diameter of a human hair. So these gravitational waves, it's only going to have a very, very small effect, and that's why we don't actually feel it, even though there are gravitational waves passing by us right now. Now, at this time, no direct detection of gravitational waves has ever been made. However, we have strong indirect evidence that gravitational waves actually do exist based on measurements of binary star systems. So a binary star system is a system, again, where you have two stars or maybe two neutron stars or, or things like that that are actually orbiting each other. Now, general relativity predicts that this is one of those systems that should produce gravitational waves. So this system is producing gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves actually carry energy away from this system. So since they're removing energy from the system, instead of having these objects just orbiting each other forever, they're very, very gradually going to spiral inwards towards each other. And as they spiral inwards, they'll start orbiting faster and faster, and that will make the period of their motion, how long it takes to make a complete orbit, that will make it get shorter and shorter. So here we have an actual figure of the motion and the period of the Hulse-Taylor binary system. So it's a binary system where we have a pulsar orbiting a neutron star. 
and we can measure the period of this system very, very accurately. So these red dots show how much the period has changed over the past 30 years. And the blue line corresponds with the prediction of general relativity, how much this period should change if these gravitational waves are actually being emitted. And we see that there is incredible agreement between the data that we've actually measured and the theory that this system actually is producing gravitational waves. So this is was such an amazing agreement that uh, Holson Taylor actually got the 1993 Nobel Prize in Physics for this. So although we haven't directly detected these gravitational waves yet, we do have strong evidence that they exist and that further pushes us to try to directly detect gravitational waves. Now, throughout the history of astronomy, most of what we've been able to learn has come from looking at the light that is given off by distant objects. Now this could be visible light, it could be x-rays or infrared or radio waves, basically all the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we've been able to learn an incredible amount from this. However, not all of the systems that we're interested in actually emit light. There's also the fact that light can be blocked by interstellar dust and interstellar gas, whereas gravitational waves will pass right through uh, interstellar dust without being affected at all. So if we're actually able to measure these gravitational waves, we'll really have an entirely new way to study the universe. And we're going to look more at how we're actually trying to detect these gravitational waves in the next few videos.